Well, good morning. Lovely to see you, all 15 of you that are in so far. <laughs> Don't know where everybody else has gone. They're probably outside in the queue. Anyway, the service is fully booked, so we definitely will fill up, but uh, not just yet. You're very welcome, you online people. Um, I am sure you're there, definitely, and uh, sitting and ready to go. So you're all very, very welcome this morning. We look forward to hearing from Chris and Davy and the pastoral folks uh, a little bit later as part of our Stepping Forward Together series. And just a big thank you to Ian and the band for leading us in worship this morning. Now, on the, uh, on the thank yous note, uh, our young adults would like to say a really big thank you to all the runners and walkers and hikers who got involved in the 10K event last weekend. You donated and raised... £1,695 at last count for Gisli and Nora in Bulgaria. And participation medals, I did say last time that they were in the foyer uh, and then realised that with the one-way system you don't go past the foyer, but they are sitting outside in the little table. So please don't nick one if you didn't do it, as I must admit I am slightly tempted to do. I don't think I ever got medals. Um, so anyway... We'll see how that goes. Then this evening at six o'clock, we are back here for communion. So if you would like to come along and are not yet signed up, we would love to see you along for our communion service this evening. Now, another little thank you then from Hope365. Um, and they are saying thank you for all the work that has gone on so far to help them open their new Ballyclare hub, which is due to go live on the 21st of June. Now, in that little picture uh, that you can see up behind me, you can see Michael from Hope365 pretty much standing with his arms folded, uh, watching Garth and the team create a new door and put in a big heavy beam and do proper, proper work. Um, over to the side, I would have to say, is probably me, a few accountants and IT professionals who were cleaning walls and doing things not quite so demanding. So with uh, Hope365, there's plenty of opportunity to get involved, and regardless of your level of ability, uh, there is certainly a job for you. The job for the next two weeks is to paint. So they're at the painting stage, and if you can help with that, please get in contact with Michael at Michael. Uh, Dot, I'm going to have to read that off this one because I can't find it in my notes. Michael at hope365.life, and that's up behind me. So thank you for that. Then I, am, I generally get bad press for being sort of the COVID police and telling you bad news and what you're not allowed to do. Uh, this morning, we're actually encouraging you to do something, uh, which is after the service, if it's still a nice, bright, sunny day out in the fresh air, please do feel free to stay around for a moment or two outside to catch up and have a chat before you leave. It would be great just to be able to do that in the nice fresh air and good morning or afternoon that we have at that stage. Then I am excited this morning to be able to tell you about a new organization that we will be partnering with. So it's called Transforming Lives for Good or TLG for short. TLG is a UK Christian charity that's dedicated to helping churches reach out into their local community and some of the most vulnerable children within a school setting. Across the UK, there are children finding it hard to cope for a range of reasons, and every day is tough. TLG is all about helping churches bring hope and a future to struggling children. This is an organization then with expertise in school exclusions, emotional well-being, and holiday hunger. TLG have several initiatives, and we are keen for Glen Abbey to be part of their early intervention program. To help explain that and what that is, please watch this little video. And then afterwards, I'm going to chat with Esther about what this means for her as she's going to be our program coordinator and also for you. Hi, my name's Kerry and I'm a TLG coach. Over the last year, I've been coaching Jasmine and this is a bit of her story. At the start of 2019, we were asked by the local primary school to work with a primary surgeon named Jasmine. Jasmine was really struggling with peer relationships and also with anger issues at home. It took a few weeks to 
start to get her to really open up. But as the weeks went on, she opened up more and we were really able to try and get to the bottom of what was causing her anger. Dawn, I was getting angry a lot at home and like other places. Okay, and uh, can you remember some of the things that we did when we first started working together? Uh, we did the colour wheel and we made it so Kerry says uh, like an emotion and I would have to pick out a colour that goes with that emotion and then like write it down. How does the colour wheel help you? It helps me to understand what emotion I'm feeling. Uh, yesterday in Subway, um, they didn't have any chicken tikka, so then I was getting annoyed. So then I remembered the colour wheel. So then I remembered the strategies that I have from Kerry, and then eventually got them to the colour green, which is calm. And then it was calm. One of the biggest challenges Jasmine had was the transition from primary school to high school. As a TLG coach, I was in a great position to support Jasmine during this time. One of the key ways that we tried to help was by walking from primary school up to high school. And I think that was really good for Jasmine, just to know that I was going to be there after the holidays. Unfortunately, around this time, Jasmine also lost her grandma. Jasmine asked her mum to contact Colin, the minister of our church and he was able to go up to the hospital and unfortunately he wasn't able to be there in time but he was able to be with grandma and that was a great comfort to Jasmine and her mum. Jasmine is progressing in all areas of life. At school she is managing to stay in class a bit more and is generally calmer. At home, although she is still having anger outbursts, she is able to recognise these more. Last week at Youth Club the question was asked to all the children, who knows you best? Without hesitation, Jasmine said me, and that was just so touching and surprising, and also really lovely to hear. For me, the uniqueness of TLG is the one-to-one -one relationship. Unfortunately, the schools just aren't in a position to do that. I get the best of Jasmine every Tuesday. We play games, we have fun, we do crafts, but we also talk about the serious things. My sessions with Jasmine are due to come to an end at Easter. I'll still see Jasmine every second week at Youth Club, and we're also planning to meet up once a month outside of school in the quest to find the best coffee shop in Dundee. Well, Esther, back again. Back again. Esther loves it here at the front, so... Uh, <laughs> We'll go easy on her this time around. So, look, really, really powerful video told, uh, story told in the video. Um, Esther, please explain for us just what, what this will look like for Glen Abbey Church. Okay, so there are a few initiatives that TLG run, and the one that Glen Abbey Church will be part of is the Early Intervention Programme, which basically is one-to-one -one coaching for children with um, social, emotional, behaviour needs within primary school and maybe early secondary school to prevent them having to be excluded and go to an education centre. So that's the programme that we are going to be taking part of. Um, there are so many resources. TLG is very, very well run. It's very robust. The resources are made by professionals in the field, by educationalists and psychologists. Um, so they really are targeting the right kind of things for these children. Um, and that's what we are hoping to do within a few primary schools. Okay, thank you. And you're going to be our coordinator? I am going to be your coordinator. So yes, I'm, I liaise with TLG. There's a girl, Jo, in Scotland who is over me. And so I'll be coordinating our volunteers and the programmes within the skills that we hopefully agree to come on board. Okay, thank you very much. So look, this looks like an absolutely fantastic opportunity to get involved and support children and families. So mm -hmm. what can people do to get involved? Well, obviously we need volunteers, um, so this is an appeal for volunteers. We are hoping to be in our three areas that we are part of the community, so in Carrickfergus, in Ballyclare and in Newton Abbey. So if you have an hour or two a week that you could spare to come alongside a vulnerable child within a school setting, it would be much appreciated. This year has been so tough for so many of us, let alone children. 
and there are many out there with needs and are feeling quite isolated and quite vulnerable and quite anxious. And this would be such an opportunity to come alongside, to spend time with them, to get to know them and to help them to understand their emotions and why they feel the way they do and to give them strategies to cope, not just within the classroom, but within life in general. So we do need volunteers. So if you are free or have, you don't need to have be an expert in this or an educationalist, just somebody who is caring and committed and is wanting to come along and serve kids in this way. Um, so please get in touch um, with me or Keith. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, look, thank you, Esther. That's, uh, I can probably release you from thank standing you. up at the front. You'd be much, much more content now. Um, so for further information, look, please do check out the TLG website. And if you think that this is something then that you would be interested in doing and getting involved in, please do contact Esther um, or me. Um, but chat to Esther and uh, you'll be able to get in contact with her on esther.snowden at glenabbey.church and she will be more than happy to answer any of your questions. So we are just at the stage now where we will commit uh, our morning, or afternoon as it possibly is now, uh, to God in prayer. And can I ask you just to stand with me as we pray this morning? First Thessalonians uh, 5 verses 16 and 18 tells us to rejoice always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. And Lord God, this morning we do rejoice and give thanks to you for what you have done for us and for this opportunity to meet together to worship you. Thank you for the work of TLG and for our opportunity to join with them in supporting children in the school setting to show your love your care for them and their families in practical and tangible ways. Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would be with us as we continue in worship to you. Amen. Adore our Lord this morning. We bow our hearts, we lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, and we surrender to the truth.
speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Let's come together as, a, as God's people to sing unto him, to worship our God of love and show love to him and to each other.
Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. All of my fears and failures Fill my life again Give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender I surrender My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save. Good morning. Yes, good morning. In case you were wrong, it's still morning. Um, it is great to see you. Uh, a couple of things just uh, I noticed uh, on my way in. First of all, uh, a couple of visitors. I met one of them out in the car park. If you are a visitor with us, you're really, really welcome this morning if you're here for the first time. But also, I've definitely, as at first service, seen some faces uh, here today that I haven't seen in quite a long time. And if you're here, back out again for the first time. It is so good. It really is so good to see you. You don't understand just what good it does. My heart and other people's hearts here when we see people who have been not around for a while and it's time for them to come back. So we really appreciate you being here and we hope you really are blessed by the time with us. Um, we are continuing to make our way through our Stepping Forward Together series as we take this time to reflect on and take stock of where we are after the impact of, of COVID and its undoubted effect on us both individually and corporately as a church. And really think about what should be important for us as we seek God's leading through His Word and by His Spirit into the next stage of our journey together. And last week, in the middle of the series, I started into a sort of mini series within the series, if you like, looking at the characteristics that we desire as we listen to God's Word 
to be evident in us as a church family. And last week, we looked at the idea of a healthy, functioning body, every member, every person playing their part, contributing with the spiritual gifts that God has given us for each other, for the whole body. This week, we're going to extend that out and consider the next connected characteristic we want to exhibit, and that is that we want to grow as a loving community. And we're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. I'm going to uh, talk for a little bit shorter than I normally do, and then we're going to have some video extracts from our pastoral ministry team to encourage us and spur us on in this area. So we're going to get started so we get everything fitted into our time. Uh, I'm returning again to Romans 12, where we were, one of the passages we're in last week, and because the section about being a loving community doesn't make sense unless we read the beginning of the chapter, we're going to read the beginning of the chapter too. So let's read together from verse 1. You can follow behind me on the screen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then this is the section for our focus over the next few minutes. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And then down to verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In the opening week of this series, we considered some of the mountains, if you remember back that far, of the surrounding cultural landscape that we're in. And one of those that we highlighted that was already a major issue before the exacerbating factors of the pandemic was the difficult issue of loneliness and isolation. Many commentators, especially in America, but also more widely in the West, actually talk about an epidemic of loneliness. And as I highlighted in that opening week in a recent UK survey, one in four people questioned reported feelings of loneliness, with the figure being significantly higher in younger age categories. And in so many instances and for so many people, the confinement since last March to home and to Zoom and everything being in the digital world with all its individualism and tribalism, as we've talked about over recent weeks, has unsurprisingly made this sense of disconnection and isolation all the more profound, all the more acute, all the more heavy. And yes, lots of us have this pseudo-connection through social media that gives a mirage of relationship and friendship, but we know often that's all that it is, a mirage which actually often serves to increase and deepen the loneliness and the isolation that we feel and experience. And of course, we as a church have not been immune to this, far from it. There's no doubt that the impact on us has been significant, and actually, it's far too early to tell just how significant it has been. It's still difficult to assess. 
but as the fault lines of disconnection and isolation that have grown since last March. Now, when opportunities for reconnection and relationship are becoming available, those cracks and chasms that have developed, that have grown and widened, that distance that's been created for many, it seems so used to be able to bridge again. Many feel too far away now to make their way back. And we've got to be realistic and honest about the challenge in front of us. Of course, there are many exceptions. But within our church family, it is going to take a really concerted effort from all of us. Not just elders, not just leaders, not just staff, not just pastoral workers, but every part of the body. As we talked about last week, as we understand our own value and each other's value, as we understand who we belong to, as we grasp our responsibility to contribute. It's going to take all of us in unity of purpose and unity of ambition to rebuild relationships, to reconnect, to gently and lovingly and patiently invite and bring the isolated and the lonely back into, or maybe for the very first time, a community of genuine love and care. And so as we do rebuild yearning to do that in a stronger, in a purer, more spirit-led way than ever before. It's vital that we do that on the foundation of God's Word. And what Romans 12 clearly says, and why I went back to the beginning of the chapter, is that if we as Glen Abbey are truly going to develop and flourish as a community that is characterized by sincere, loving relationships inside a culture of radical individualism, then that is only possible if we are a community of people with minds transformed by the Holy Spirit. It's so important that we realize that a community like the one that Paul talks about here cannot be built on trying harder. That will, it's just doomed to failure. It can't be built on resolution. It can only be built on transformation. Transformation that the Spirit brings about in us through an increasing understanding of the mercy of God in our lives, through grasping more and more the truth of who we are, who we would be without Christ, and the truth that in Him and through Him we have gone from, as the rest of Romans talks about, alienation to adoption, enemies to children, slavery to freedom, desolation to hope, death to life because of the plans, the purposes, the grace, the mercy, the love of God in our lives. We can only be a community that gives out sincere love if we are a community truly meditating on filling our collective perspective and imagination and intellect with God's love and grace for us, looking at everything in our lives through that prism. We need to be a community centered and focused on grasping the truth of God's mercy and allowing the truth of God's mercy to grasp and take hold of us. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's where it has to start. And then the key evidence of that transformation, the fruit, the key fruit of that in us is humility. Look how Paul repeats the necessity of it as a prerequisite to loving community throughout this passage. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. And then later on, he says again, do not be proud. And then he says again, do not be conceited. I think he's trying to make a point here. Pride. Pride in our hearts, pride in our relationships. I'm good they're not so good. I'm right, they're wrong. I'm better, they're worse. I'm worth this, they're worth that. Pride is the kryptonite to loving community. We need to not be trying harder, but crying out to God by His Spirit to help us grasp His mercy for us while we were still unworthy sinners. We need to be shown that so that he can work in our hearts to dismantle that pride, to break down this overwhelming desire all of us have to exalt ourselves 
and work in us this fruit of his spirit, this fruit of humility. And then, and only then, from that foundation of transformed minds, with that underpinning of humility, can the community, can the family, can we, the body of Christ, begin to look like and be characterized by what's in Paul's list here from verse 9 onwards. I'm just going to pick up a, a few of the highlights of that just in the few minutes that I have. So let's just go through that together. First of all, he says in this opening statement that also summarizes everything that comes after it, love must be sincere. There is so much insincere love around. We all know it. We all see it. We all experience it. An untransformed mind, a mind and heart motivated by pride, tends to love that way. It might be great at social media thumbs up. It might be great even at pressing the heart button instead of the thumbs up, going up a level. It might be great at praying hands on WhatsApp groups. And don't under, misunderstand me. I'm not saying those things are wrong. I'm not saying those things don't have a place. Of course they do if they're motivated sincerely, but they're also very good covers. There are also easy options to give the appearance of love while actually motivated by self-service and pride to make me look loving without any substance or without any sacrifice underneath. Pride-fueled, self-serving, insincere love is like the table that looks like it's made of solid oak, but when you cut into it, you realize it's just chipboard underneath. It's just a little veneer around the outside. But sincere love, motivated by grace and permitted by humility, is not hypocritical. It's genuine. It's real underneath. It delivers on what it promises. It is oak the whole way through. Sincere love is courageous and sacrificial in pursuit of the good of the other person, even when that means challenging and not accepting because sincere love, as Paul says here, hates what is evil and clings to what is good. Sincere love loves what God loves and hates what God hates. Sincere love is also devoted to. That's the word that Paul uses here. Listen to the strength of that word, devoted to others in community. And the language he uses here is family language devoted to others as if they were real family. Transformed thinking considers ourselves within the body, devotes ourselves within the body as if we are real brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, children and grandchildren. What is it you're prepared to do for family? Sincere love in the body of Christ is prepared to go to those lengths for this family to. Love that is sincere also shares. This passage says it shares burdens, shares need. It makes your burden my burden. It makes my need your need. As we talked about last week, it recognizes that each of us belong to each other. And so that it is able to respond to need, Love that is sincere puts itself in a position to actually see and find need. It's so easy, isn't it? Especially after the year plus of social distancing that we've just experienced. And especially in a church like Glen Abbey of this size, it's so easy to keep ourselves just far enough away. So easy to keep ourselves just enough at arm's length that we don't see and encounter the needs and burdens of others in the body. If you follow sport, football or rugby or or anything else really, you'll know that the best sports people have this amazing knack of being in the right place at the right time. So it is with people with transformed minds in the body of Christ. They are people who, it looks effortless, but it's got so much purpose. 
and selflessness. They have this knack of putting themselves in the right places. They are people that have patiently stuck around for a long time in those right places. They put themselves in close enough proximity through small groups or service teams or all sorts of other unofficial ways to be able to respond where and when need arises. They are the people that are there to rejoice with those who rejoice. We are terrible at that in Northern Ireland. We just want to knock the knees out from under people, don't we? They're there to mourn with those who mourn because they've built trust. Experienced that over the last year. There's only certain people that you can let in. And it's only people that have been there before who you can trust. They're not too far away, these people. They're not out of range. They're not too late. That's what we want to be. We want to be a church full of people like that. And then finally, for now, love that is sincere practices hospitality, but it practices And it pursues hospitality in such a different way to the world. It goes beyond mutual equal friendships. It goes beyond transactional hospitality, where you know you're going to get invited back. It goes beyond and reaches and invites in as special and loves and values and serves those on the margin. That's what Jesus says to his host at a dinner party in Luke 14, when you give a lunch or a dinner. Don't invite your friends or brothers or sisters or relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, this is Jesus here as he does on other occasions, using a Jewish, using a Semitic idiom. It's exaggeration for effect. In other words, he's not saying you can't have your parents round, you can't have your kids round, you can't have your in-laws round for dinner. So don't cancel anything this afternoon based on what I've said, all right? Unless you've got a mother-in-law coming round and you want an excuse, <laughs> all right? That's, that, you can use that, feel free to, feel free to quote me. Can I just say, because she was here at first service and I wouldn't put it past her to watch the live stream and make sure I said again, I love my (laughs) mother-in-law. All right? So just in case you're watching, Pamela. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. What he's saying is if our invites only extend that far, only extend to people that we know will invite us back, we are not practicing hospitality in the way that we've been called to practice hospitality. How much we as Glen Abbey love and value and invite in the least amongst us. According to how the world attributes value is a litmus test of how much we love the Lord Jesus and how much we've grasped and understood and taken hold of his grace in our own lives. I want to be genuinely want to be a part of a community growing more and more in this direction, in this way. It's not easy. Such a challenge. Genuine love, devotion, honor, burden sharing, tear sharing, hope sharing, food sharing, laughter sharing, life sharing. A family where everyone, everyone both gives and receives the love of Christ through the love of each other. We are the body of Christ. Each one of us is a part of it. Each one of us belongs to all the others. And just as I said a few weeks ago when we were talking about singing, that the answer to who's on the praise team is we are. So the answer to who is on the pastoral care team in Glen Abbey is we are. Each and every single one of us bears that responsibility. We are called to devote ourselves to others, to honor others above ourselves, to share, bless. We're all called to overcome evil with good. You are, I am, we are the pastoral care team of Glen Abbey Church. And we need to remember that. 
And I'd ask you to keep that in mind over the next few minutes as we take the opportunity now to watch this video, which will introduce you to our pastoral ministry team. These guys are the safety nets. They're not there to do everything. But just so that they can share some reflections and some stories with you. Watch this and, and then I'll come back up to close. Hi, my name is David Mears, and I'm one of the staff elders at Glen Abbey Church, with particular responsibility for overseeing pastoral care, including a liaison role with our home group ministry team. This morning, I'd like the pastoral ministry team to introduce themselves to you and share an insight into some of the many aspects of pastoral care they are involved in as we consider the importance of hospitality and love for one another. As a church family at Glen Abbey, we believe that everyone has a responsibility to care for one another, which really means that the whole church is a pastoral care network. As Chris reminded us last week, we need him and he needs us. As we come alongside one another in various ways, we have the opportunity to outwork the one another mandates of the New Testament. To help with this, we look to provide opportunities for everyone to connect and belong through our different small groups and service teams across all our ministries. This is supported by the elders and a small team of pastoral workers who are involved in regular contact with individuals within their respective areas of engagement and within their roles as elders and pastoral workers at Glen Abbey. Recently, Chris and I had the privilege of meeting with one of our members at their request to anoint them with oil and pray for their healing. This was such a joy for us and an encouragement for that individual as they outwork the command in James 5 to call the elders in time of sickness. Each month as we meet as elders, we take time to pray pastorally for people and situations across the church, alongside contacting, visiting, or in recent days, just meeting up for a walk to encourage individuals. If you ever want to speak with any of the elders, please feel free to contact them and we'll be more than happy to meet with you. Enough from me. Let's hear from the rest of the pastoral ministry team. Hello, my name is Richard Robinson and I serve on the pastoral ministry team and oversee our welcome team on Sunday mornings. The pastoral ministry team meets each month to oversee the pastoral care and to consider ways in which we can make people more aware of how they can access support. We have a small team of pastoral workers who are available to contact people, visit at home or in hospital. And whilst we recognise that this has not been possible over recent months, we're grateful for our team and their willingness to contact people, especially during the first lockdown. Recently, the ministry team put together the pastoral survey, which many of you responded to. The survey was anonymous as well as confidential. So if you wanted to be contacted and didn't leave us your contact details, we're unable to follow you up. So please feel free to contact any of us. The survey was really helpful. To th so thank you for responding to it. We're really encouraged by the comments and suggestions provided. And we are currently considering and working through how best to implement some of these, especially around highlighting who the pastoral workers are and how to contact them as we move forward. One of the other areas we are also looking at is the reintroduction of prayer in the prayer room after services. So as restrictions continue to ease, this will be put back into place. Thank you. Hello, my name is Madam Humphrey and I'm part of the pastoral team. I'm also on the pastoral staff at Glen Abbey with particular responsibility for women and families. Lockdown's been very difficult for lots of families, with job losses, isolation, and all sorts of things going on. I thought I'd like to tell you a wee bit about one family who didn't come to Glen Abbey, but were introduced to us by a member who knew them. This family had a new baby. They were both working in zero hour contract jobs. And when we were introduced to them, they were in a terrible situation completely. They had had no electricity for three days because they had no money to top up the meter. They went to bed hungry every night 
because they fed the baby instead of feeding themselves. Uh, the husband in the couple um, rode a bike to work, um, to get to work, and so, but his bike had broken. So because the bike had broken, he was walking to work. Um, they live about a mile from here, um, and he walked to work in East Belfast every day. So straight away, we knew that there was real, real issues with them, and how difficult life was for them. And we sorted out some of the issues very quickly. Um, first thing we did was we got his bike fixed. We topped up the electricity cord, obviously. We got them sorted with food bank and with CAP, introduced them to CAP um, as they had some issues with a previous debt. Um, and we directed them to a benefits check place, which sadly, although they went to them and they did all they could for them, that they actually aren't entitled to any benefits whatsoever as she's not from the EU and therefore they're not entitled to anything, even though they're in minimum wage, zero hour jobs. Then after that, we were able to invoke the Barnabas Fund to help with some issues, some other issues. So we just want to say thank you to you for donating to the Barnabas Fund. Last week, this family told us that if it hadn't been for the help they received from us uh, and from Barnabas, that they wouldn't have made it through lockdown or her maternity leave or anything. Life still isn't easy for them, but they are so grateful for their help they've received. They've been to a couple of in-person services now and they've connected with the online services as well, which is great. So again, I just want to say thank you for your generosity, for your kindness, which means that we can help church families in need, but also we can help families in the community who are in great need, as these this wee family were and still are. So thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for everything that you've done, and God bless you for what you've done for us. Hi, my name is Jill Campbell, and I serve on the pastoral care team here at Glen Abbey, and I also help lead a home group in Carrick with the lovely Phil. And Davy Mares has asked me to share how pastoral care works in my experience. And I suppose my experience has largely been within a home group setting where I think pastoral care is slightly different in that it's not so much that one-to-one -one, uh, support, it's more of a mutual support. It's everybody sort of in it together and uh, providing encouragement and um, spurring each other on. I think Chris hit the nail on the head last week whenever he talked about um, showing up. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things in home group is that you need to be committed. You needed to be turning up and building relationships with one another um, and just getting to know each other's lives. Um, in my experience, if the devil can isolate you, he can influence you. And there are a lot of lies that run about inside our head. Um, and can wreak all sorts of havoc and perhaps if we have the discipline of just getting ourselves out of our own heads and into a community of people who can speak truth into us it can provide huge benefits for us and the other thing is I think as Christians we probably all have a duty to be a godly influence on each other and just this morning in the prayer diary we prayed um, Help me to be aware of your Holy Spirit's prompting in my life. And I think we could probably all um, speak of somebody who has spoke, ha had an a godly influence on our lives. And that can be from the huge things that potentially change the direction of our lives to the small things like um, give you a fresh perspective on something or give you a good piece of advice or share, share your experience with somebody else whenever you went through that situation and these things happen in the small you know conversations the, the chat at the start of home group the, the meeting up for a cup of coffee or the going for a walk or the wee text messages back and forward and um, you get to know the detail in the day-to-day -day of somebody's life and you know what just sometimes a proper belly laugh or you're in company and just having a really good time can lift your spirits and just even provide that level of pastoral care so what does it practically look like? Um, my goodness, the list is endless. 
Um, but in my experience, it can be from here to here. It can be from somebody who just notices that you're not about, and let's face it, we all like to be missed, to somebody who you will turn to in a crisis, simply because you've built up that relationship and you know you can trust them with this information. Um, it can be somebody to provide a meal whenever you're ill or a family member's ill or it can be somebody just to provide a listening ear whenever you need to talk. It can be somebody just to sit and pass time with you if you're going through a period of anxiety, just getting through the day and somebody coming alongside you to uh, a, a diagnosis or an illness or some really bad news where you just need people to come in under you and maybe provide a meal, provide a lift for your kids, uh, run you to the hospital so you don't have to find a parking space um, and just be a support to you um, as you go there and back again. It can be a myriad of things but it's that being involved in people's daily life and just knowing what their needs are which provides an enormous level of support. So I think undergirding all of those things is the huge privilege of being able to pray for each other. And I came across a thing uh, a couple of weeks ago that I've been pondering on that stated sometimes as Christians we can get very hung up on unanswered prayer. And yet, is it a possibility that God's heart breaks over the unasked prayer? And I think in home group it gives us a fantastic opportunity just to be have that exposure in other people's lives and just hold them up and hold each other up and pray over each other's lives, our, our work colleagues, our unsaved friends, um, all sorts of things, that privilege of prayer. So my two things would probably be um, for that level of pastoral care, just be in community, just turn up and be a godly influence in each other's lives. Pastoral care at Glen Abbey is about bringing an awareness of God's presence to those in situations where he can be missed. And we need to support one another in this endeavour as we seek to love and support each other in these days. So thank you to David and to Richard and Madeline and Jill. Just giving you that little bit of an idea of what goes on in those safety nets and, and in those situations. But reminding ourselves, as I said before, that... And as David said as well, that we all are the pastoral care team. So as we close, I just want to ask a question. As we step forward together, as fresh opportunities for connection, for building relationships, for hospitality begin to open up again for us, just to ask you simply, would you prayerfully consider with this Romans 12 passage in front of you with the 1 Corinthians 13 passage that Caroline read, that with the Gospels in front of you, how you might respond, how you might take even the smallest of steps forward in contributing to Glen Abbey growing as a loving community. And that might be something as simple as reversing a trajectory of withdrawal that you've been on. Really struck there by what Jill said about if the devil can isolate you, the devil can influence you. And I've no doubt that many of us can think of stories of, of friends or family members where that has been the case, beginning to isolate themselves first and that taking them further and further away from the body of Christ and further and further away from Christ himself. So maybe it's after this period you've been on, putting yourself back in a position to receive and to give love again. But also it might be strengthening and working at relational bonds to be in the right place as we talked about. In the right place to be able to share burdens, to rejoice with others, to be trusted with mourning with others. It might be taking hold of this fresh opportunity to practice hospitality according to Jesus' blueprint and not just in a similar way to the world does. And each step, however small, however faltering, whatever it is, being driven not by pride, 
nor by guilt, but as a response to God's mercy for us, remembering we love because he first loved us. Let's pray together. Can we stand as we do that, please? And then the band will come back up and we'll sing together to finish. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Father, thank you that you have loved us. Thank you that you continue to love us. And thank you that you will continue to love us. Your love will never fade and will never fail. And we can be completely secure and assured of your love. Continue your work in us of transforming us by renewing our minds. Dismantle pride. Grow humility in us by your spirit. We desire to be a body, a family, characterized by, known for sincere, courageous, sacrificial love. A family of grace, a family of forgiveness, a family of sharing burdens. And we pray now for those in our church family who are in that place of loneliness and isolation, where those chasms feel too big to come back from, to bridge once more. And we ask that you will strengthen them, give them what they need to take the first steps back. And at the same time, by your spirit, you'll put people in place to respond to that step and to invite in and to welcome back. Move by your spirit in a fresh way in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you your heart. 
Father, we recognize how difficult this teaching is. In fact, on our own, it just feels overwhelming. So we acknowledge to you our weakness. And we ask you to move in us and through us in your strength. May your strength be made perfect in our weakness. And our prayer for this week ahead is the words of this song, this song, that you would show us who you are, and that you would fill us with your heart, and that you would lead us in love to those around us. We need you. We need your spirit. We need your power to be able to do that. May this be a body that more and more as a body that demonstrates the love of Christ in our interactions and our relationships with each other. In Jesus' name, amen.